like us to begin by considering the title of the module, the title of the course itself. So legal method, what does that even mean? Now, if we think of the word legal in its grammatical sense, it's essentially reference to something that is of or relating to law. But it can also be meant in an institutional sense. That is legal, meaning that is lawful, that is permitted. But then it can go even further than that, and legal can be understood ideologically. So if I use the word legal, then I'm distinguishing from something that is moral, something that is ethical, something that is theological. When I use the word legal, I'm drawing upon certain institutions. Now when we tie that into the word method, legal method, now method can be an adjective, but method is mostly used as a noun, in which we're designating a procedure, a system, some type of a practice. Essentially, it is a way of doing something, a way of doing something that follows a plan. What we infer from a method, or from the definition of a method, is that there is logic. There is a system. There is order. There is sequence. Hence why we use the term method. Now if we combine these two definitions, legal and method, we combine the two, it gives us the answer as to what you should expect to learn from this course. Well, first you should expect to learn a way of doing law following a plan. But it's not only that. We go a little bit further and we understand that that way is necessarily logical or orderly. So what are the implications? When we say a way of doing law, we're suggesting that in fact there are multiple ways of doing law. We are going to teach you one, two, three, some ways, but it's not possible to cover all of those ways. What are we also implying? Well, we're implying that there is some type of agreement around what doing law means. And this is necessarily the case when we say logic or order or sequence or system. As soon as we use those words, as soon as we introduce the term method, then we're suggesting that there is some type of objectivity almost to it. Something that is accepted by practitioners within the field. Third, we're also implying that this method can be taught that this method can be learned. Fourth, when we pull all of this together, what we seem to be suggesting is that the doing of law is almost scientific. There's an approach, there's a method, there's a system, there's a sequence, there's an order. And if you do all of that, you are doing law, presumably in the right way. Now, of course, this would itself leads to many other questions. For example, which ways and why have we selected those ways above others? Another question, who is the we that I'm referring to? Why are we using that pronoun? And who is included in that group? What is involved when we make or understand or interpret or imply, apply the law? And then, preeminently, which law? What is meant by law? If, as soon as you use the word law, there seems to be a common understanding as to what is implied as to what is meant. But can we unpack that a little bit further? Now these are some of the questions that we'll explore in the context of this module. Most books on legal method, including the one that's been assigned for this module, will take for granted or at least place great emphasis on state-based law. We're referring to state structures, state institutions, and as a result, state-based communities. A state-based law is regulating the behavior, the relations between individuals who make up a community. In this case, the nation-state. Now, on many levels, this makes perfect sense. If we think about jurisdiction, jurisdiction is the key defining feature to legal authority. Both the defining feature geographically, who has jurisdiction, who has authority within 
a particular area. So we define it geographically, but then we also define it now, substantively. The law is partitioned between different branches of government. Now again, the emphasis on state-based law also makes sense because higher authorities describe law as a system of rules that itself emanates from a higher authority. And that higher authority in question is usually government. There are other higher authorities. One can think of the Vatican. The Vatican is a government on some level, but is more than just a government, and it possesses some authority. But does it possess legal authority? Is something that we'll explore a little bit further in the context of this module. You'll also learn about jurisdiction that legal, legal education is jurisdictionally restrictive. Lawyers can qualify in one jurisdiction, or lawyers who have qualified in one jurisdiction, often find it challenging to transfer to another jurisdiction. The practice of law, the profession itself, is territorially bounded, territorially protected. And this isn't the case for many other professions. So the second lesson that you should expect to learn from this module are some of the ways in which governments, in which legal agents, make, understand, interpret, and apply state-based law. Now, of course, you probably should or are and should be asking questions about the adequacy of this approach. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we look at the basic rule. Governments make law. We know that much. This is statutory law is how we refer to it. Governments appoint judges who are empowered, who are tasked with interpreting law. And they, as a result of these activities, produce what is known as common law. Governments enter into treaties, agreements, with other governments, which produces international law. Governments oversee civil servants. Governments respond to public preferences. Sometimes they create these public preferences. And one of the most important roles that governments have is regulating the role of citizens within the legal system. What are citizens permitted to do? What are they prohibited from doing? We can think of this in relation to claims. Now, some claims can be brought against the state. An example of this, the denial of an NHS claim. Now, you go to the hospital, you request a particular service, you are denied that service, a claim can be brought against the state in which you feel that you have been wronged. A type of claim that cannot be brought against the state. We know that government outsources a number of services to contractors, to private contractors, and occasionally, as we've seen in the media, those private contractors will engage in human rights violations. Are we permitted to bring a claim against the contractor? Are we permitted to bring a claim against the state? Well, in most instances, no. So government is effectively delineating the role, the powers of citizens within the legal system. Hence why, again, we focus very much on state-made 